Smog, Eustace, Jurgen, Maleficent, Jormungandr, the serpent from Midgard in Norse mythology, Tiamat, Trogdor, Bowser, dragons, dragons. There are hordes of dragons in the tale, in tale after tale of timeless culture shaping tale. They're everywhere. Why? Interesting, isn't it, that the epic stories that have so captivated our imaginations have nasty dragons roaming about their lands that need to be slayed. Now, one can just dismiss this cross-cultural pattern that's just global. One can dismiss the, the patterns of, of scales and of slaying dragons as the stuff of fancy or of just children's stories. Or, or one can wonder a little bit. Wonder what aspects of reality these stories speak of, what they call to, what's behind the stories. Why do dragons lurk in our imaginations? Is there some illuminating truth about the serpents in the shadows? Well, today we see the serpent in the book of 1 Samuel, and one of the world's most famous stories, right? The story of David and Goliath. Now, this is a serpent-crushing, dragon-slaying kind of story, but so often uh, it's gutted, it's, it's mishandled. And today, uh, what we want to do is some deep work in the text and show that this is no simple underdog story to encourage us to get some more pluck and some more grit and then overcome the odds. This story is actually a microcosm of the whole history of redemption. It is the Bible in miniature. So let's see how that plays out. So let's go back to the Iron Age, circa 1025 BC to the hill country of Israel. Now, the, the westernmost side of Israel, right, is the coast. It is the Mediterranean Sea. And there are a number of valleys that run from the coast, from the Mediterranean to the east and up into the very heart of Israel. And the Philistines, they are a coastal people. And they were ever at odds with Israel. And they are on a campaign, a march to take over the land. So they're moving from the coast. They're moving from the west, east, into the heartland of Israel. And they approach a valley there that is called the Valley of Elah. So let's go ahead and throw up that slide there. This is the Valley of Elah. We're dealing with real places, right? Real zip codes, longitudes, latitudes, history, real places. This is the Valley of Elah. Elah is the, is the Hebrew word for the, the terebinth tree. You can see there's lots of trees there in that valley. We're looking west. That's where the army of the Philistines were. And on the east side of the valley here, this is where the army of Israel was in our story. So again, one side of the Snaking Valley is the army of Israel ready to defend their land against Israel. Those on the other side, the Philistines, who are threatening. So the valley's a, a military buffer zone in between. There's a stalemate. It's total deadlock. Neither army wants to go into the valley to make the first move. Why? Well, whoever goes into the low spot, they're the vulnerable ones, right? They're the vulnerable ones. Neither side wants to give up the high ground. And so as we come to our story, we see that they are in a deadlock for 40 days. Now 40 days, that should ring some bells if you're thinking about other stories in the Bible. The number 40 has to do with the time of testing. And this is a time of testing. So let's read some verses and work through it bit by bit. Verses 1 through 4. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Demim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, drew up in a line of battle against the Philistines, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side of the valley between them. So again, we have Team West, right? That's the Philistines. And, and Team East, that's Saul's army, and that's Israel. And th there's so much embedded in these, in these words. I'll pull one out really briefly. But the place that they stay is called Ephes Damim. 
Uh, and in Hebrew, that, that means the boundary of blood, the borderline of blood. So there's a transgression that's happening here. And these, these place names are saying the Philistines are penetrating into God's land, into the promised land. These are invaders. Now verse 4 says, There came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So what we come to find out is that in this 40-day deadlock, each and every day, morning and evening, this giant hulk of a man steps into the valley where his words would carry, and he mocks Yahweh, he mocks God's people, and he throws out a challenge. He says, come get me. Because whoever wins this one-on-one combat will win for everyone. Now, this super soldier is six cubits and a span. What does that mean? Well, a cubit is approximately 18 inches. So elbow to fingertip, that's a cubit. So 18 inches and a span is the breadth of a hand. So the tip of your pinky to the tip of your thumb. Okay, so cubit, span. So that's 18, right, times 6 plus 9 inches. Okay, so a cubit 18 inches and a span 9 inches. So you do the calculation and this guy's about 9-9. Nine, nine. That's a pretty good size. That's a pretty good size. The point is that this is a fearsome giant of a man that has a whole army shaking in their boots, right? Well, he's from Gath. Now, if you do the work there with the the name Gath, all sorts of stuff pops. What is Gath? Well, Gath is an ancient stronghold of the Anakim. And if you go back through the history and read the stories, the Anakim was a race of giant... Uh, super soldiers, basically. They were these ferocious warriors, just ridiculously tall, who lived in the promised land. And when Joshua went into the promised land, he was called to dispatch them, to get them out of there because of their evil and their cruelty. And remember when the 12 spies go into the promised land? Right? Ten of them come back, and what do they say? Uh-uh. No way. Right? We're like grasshoppers. They're huge. They're giants. So they're, they're talking about the Anakim. Right? The bloodline, the relatives of this guy, Goliath. Okay, with that said, we get to verses 5 through 7. This Goliath, he had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, which means really big. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. This is the Iron Age. The Philistines were some of the the advance guard in using the technology. So you don't want to go against somebody with iron when all you have is bronze. And his shield bearer went before him. This is an inordinately detailed bit on his armor. What's the point? What's the point? Well, when you calculate this out, it's about 125 to 150 pounds of, of bronze armor, depending upon which way you go with what a shekel is. But notice it says bronze. How many times? Four times. It says it four times. Why? Why the repetition? Every time an author does repetition, they're trying to make a point, right? See, what we're getting at here is that this is not just some wow details about some big baddie. We were getting clues that this is not just another bad guy, but this bad guy is another serpent in God's garden. And this is the author's way of highlighting this incredible pattern. See, and here's how this works out. So the Hebrew word for bronze is nachashet. Okay, that's fun to say. So you got to say it with me. Nachashet. Nachashet, okay? And it says it four times. Nachashet, 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 nachashet. Now why is that important? Because if you were a Hebrew reader reading this out loud and somebody was sitting in the audience or let's say your kid was there, they would think you were talking about a snake. Because the Hebrew word for serpent is nachash. Nachashet, 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 nachashet. So what well, comes across is not only the sound, the sibilant sound, but actually a word that is tied into this word serpent. Let me bring some more to this here. Um, Secondly, Goliath's armor is called male armor. That actually means scale armor. It is a coat of scales. The Hebrew word here is kaskaset. And that is a word for like scales on a serpent or scales on a fish. 
Okay, so he's wearing this bronze outfit made of scales. The effect is that this invader into God's land is rendered as a serpent shining like fire in the sunlight, in God's promised land, in God's fertile land, in God's garden. Goliath is a scaly enemy. And it's important to note that there's two individuals in scriptures that, uh, that are uh, shown to be with scales, and it's Goliath and Pharaoh, right? God's enemy who is holding his people and trying to kill God's people. So this, by the way, when you think of these words, um, the hash and the hashet, bronze and serpent, bronze and serpent, bronze and serpent, does any other story float to the mind from the Old Testament? Bronze, and I see heads doing, doing this. Yeah, this should bring to mind another story called, uh, well, it's from Numbers. Well, let's go to that one. Numbers 21, uh, verse 9, verse 8 and 9. And in this story, really quickly, God's people have been redeemed from that, the serpent, the scaly one, the Pharaoh, in Egypt. Now they're on their way to the promised land, but Egypt's still inside them. They start bickering and complaining and grumbling and groaning and accusing God. And so there's a curse of these fiery serpents. The people say, Moses, okay, we messed up. Would you pray for us? Stand in the gap for us. He prays and God says, put a fiery serpent up on a pole. Have everyone look at it. And whoever looks upon that weird pole thing will be healed. Well, it's a bronze serpent. He makes a bronze serpent. And the hash and the hash. So the scripture is, is putting these patterns together to link serpents and curse and then a need for redemption and a need for salvation. Now, if you're checked out and like, what is happening right now? Like, hold on, okay? We're going we're gonna to bring these details together. So hold, hold on with me. Point is... Goliath is rendered as a scaly, serpentine, invading evil into God's land of flourishing. Okay? Are we there? Yes, we're there. Okay. Now, Goliath is also called the Philistine champion in chapter 17, verse 4. This word here for champion doesn't just mean like somebody who just won a battle. It means, in Hebrew, the man in the middle. Or the in-between man. The man in between. In other words, he stands in between his army and Israel, right? Goliath is the one who goes and he steps forward for 40 days and says, I will fight on behalf of my nation. Bring me someone who will fight on behalf of your nation. Send me a representative. I will represent my people your guy will re represent yours, and as it goes with the warrior, so it goes with the army and the nation. Your guy wins, you win. I win, my team wins. He is the man in the middle, the representative. Okay? The man in the middle. You can see that in verses 8 through 11. He says, it says, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves. Let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Right? So you see how these two representatives are going to come into combat. And wh whichever representative wins, that nation wins. Now when does he do this? Every morning and every evening. This is fascinating. Every morning and every evening, you'll see it later in our text when I read it, he comes out. This is, a, this is really significant. Because what were the Israelite people called to do twice a day in the morning and in the evening? They were to come out and pray. They were to come and, and, and sacrifice to their God in the morning and in, their evening, in the evening and to recite the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So now you link these things together. So when Israel was, was praying God's word and worshiping, right, the serpent comes, interrupts, distracts, mocks God, and mocks his people. He's taking the, the focus off of God. 
and he's disrupting it with, with fear and with lies. So, so do we see this? Do we see it? Goliath is no mere muscle-bound super soldier, right? He is a representative of the snake, of the evil that runs the course through the Bible that were first introduced in the garden. The, this Goliath is the seed of the serpent. He is one of the many seeds of the serpent that we see in Scripture. He's invading God's garden. He's trying to break trust in God's word and instill fear and bring death. And if, and if you don't know it because you're new to the Scripture, which is totally okay, and we're so glad you're here because there's so many cool things to learn in it, um, or if it's not popping up in your mind right now, when the story of Scripture begins really quickly into it, we see this serpentine evil enter into a garden designed for, for flourishing and, and worship. And God's word twisted and bent and lies happening to destroy God's image bearers. And then so God comes and he speaks to the serpent and to Adam and Eve. And he says that an offspring or a seed of Eve will be in conflict with an offspring or seed of the serpent. And they are going to go at it. This is a seed of the serpent, Goliath. Well, that said, what about David? Where's the seed of the woman? All right, verses 12 through 18. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, the next to him, Abinadab and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. In other words, he's the eighth. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Oh yeah, also, don't forget, take this box of cheese, right? Take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. So this links us back to last week's message. If you weren't here, that was where this unexpected, right, outcast shepherd boy was anointed as the king of Israel. He was the youngest son, the runt, the sheep keeper. It's David. And then here in our passage today, again, we see there's a, a primacy or like these three older brothers. They're the great ones, right? Because they're the ones who are with the king and they're fighting beside the king. Now, how's David described? He's the DoorDash guy, right? He's the pizza delivery boy. He's, he's the gopher, when he's not stepping in sheep dip in the fields of Bethlehem, he's carrying boxes of food to the important people who are fighting the big, important battle. So, listen to this with, with scriptural eyes and ears right now. So here he comes on mission from his father to bring food to his brothers who are amidst a life and death battle and will bring a victory. We'll come back to that. So here comes DoorDash David, right? It's about a 15-mile hike from Bethlehem to the Valley of Elah. He gets up super early in the morning, takes the hike through the hills, drops off the boxes of food, and he happens to be there just in time to hear this big booming voice resounding through the Valley of Elah. He hears Goliath mock Yahweh, mock his people, and then call out for a challenger. And this, I imagine this indignation, right, swirls in, in David's chest. What is this about? How is this the case? This massive windbag is dishonoring God, defying him, threatening to kill all of us, and no one's doing anything. Forty days? Where are you all at? And somebody there tells him, hey, look, whoever goes out and takes this guy out, gets the king's daughter, gets a huge 401k, and never has to pay taxes the rest of their life. David's like, hmm, okay. Let me get this right. And I think we misread this sometimes. It's not like David's like, sweet, give me the woman in the cash. David says, did you guys hear what he said you get? Is that right? And everyone's like, yeah, that's, that's right. And you're not doing anything. 
And that isn't even the reason to go out and do it. He's dishonoring our God. No one's going to defend our king. We fight for God's glory. We fight for the truth of who he is. How can we lose if this guy is an enemy of the God who split the seas and brought a whole nation of people through the desert? How can we lose? Big brother Eliab, he's not digging this. He takes a page out of Goliath's book and he starts to mock David. Excuse me? And you are, oh, the little shepherd boy. That's right. And you're not just a shepherd. You're the shepherd of a tiny little flock. You're like the least of the shepherds. Why are you here to rubberneck, to watch a spectacle? Get out of here, you little runt. Right? So he reads in the riot act. Well, the news of this courageous or crazy shepherd gets to Saul. Saul calls David in and talks to him and says, what are you talking about amongst all the warriors? Like, you can't go fight this bronze tank of a man. You're a little kid. David says in verses 34 through 37, I won't read it all. He says, okay, yes. He says, but I'm a shepherd, and, and let me tell you something. When a lion or a bear came and grabbed one of the lambs and went off with it, I followed it. And I beat the tar out of that thing until it dropped the lamb. And if it then did turn on me, because I would let it go if it didn't fight anymore, but if it turned on me to fight me, I would grab it by the scruff of its chin and I would beat it and I would kill it. God helped me fight those beasts. He allowed me and empowered me to do what I needed to do to to save the sheep from the, the mouth of the beast. This is just one more beast. This Goliath, he's acting like a beast. God can take him down. So I can do this. Let's go. Right? Well, um, we see the, the emphasis here. This is really important. The emphasis for David is that God wins his battles. God wins his battles. And throughout the rest of Samuel, whenever you see David winning a battle, it's because God won the battle for David. He has a God-saturated consciousness, a God-saturated confidence as well. Well, Saul, at this point, he's either impressed or just like really intrigued. He's like, all right, right, because he's not doing his duty. He's being passive. He's the one. He's the giant. Paul, Saul is like head and shoulders above everyone else. This should be a battle between two giants, Saul and Goliath. But Saul's like chilling back here going like some, I'm not doing this. Somebody else do it, right? So he's like, okay, David, you can go. But before you go, here's my armor. And so he straps this younger guy with with Saul's armor, which happens to be scale armor as well. So he's dressing him like Goliath. And he's saying, I want you to use my armor and my weapons and fight my way and go and fight this guy. And David's like, this isn't happening uh, this isn't battle tested for me. This, this armor will be my coffin. God and his provision is my way. And I just, real quickly, um, so often we, we wear the world's armor and wield the world's weapons in order for the cause of Christ. And that is not how it works. We do the things that seem intuitive and we fight back and we throw more toxicity, and we beat people down, and we can't wait to see somebody else slammed down in in the name of Jesus to prove someone's wrong. It's like, we're picking up the world's armor and the world's weapons instead of going in the way a shepherd would. So the tension ratchets up. Armies on both sides of the valley watch as this figure makes his way down to the little wadi, right? This little little creek bed that's still there to this day. And he has his rod and he has his sling in his hand and David goes and he picks up his five smooth stones, finds the best caliber of bullets that he can. And this young, anointed, incognito king takes on the offensive. He goes towards Goliath. This is, look, this is the very image of an active responsibility taking man who steps up to protect and to keep God's garden these words are ringing in my head just because we had a men's night uh, a little bit ago um, and Pastor Dane was talking at our uh, business meeting the other night talking about 
what does it mean to keep our gardens and to be active rather than to be passive. And man, just reading this again, it's like David steps up. He's not passive. He goes active and he steps up to protect and to guard at great cost to himself. This is, this is the negative image of Adam in the garden who goes passive and says, not my fault, hers. David says, I'm taking this on. Let's go. God can do this. Amen. Goliath sees his opponent as a boy and he scoffs. Verses 43 through 46. Here's what happens. David, on the offensive, goes towards Goliath. Goliath says, what, am I a golden retriever that you would come at me with sticks? He's like, this isn't even going to be fun. It's going to be so easy. I'm going to kill you and throw your carcass and, and the birds are going to eat it. <laughs> David undaunted, not because he's just naturally brave, but because he knows whose he is. And he knows who is with him. Remember, by this point, he's been anointed with the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. He's rightfully assessing the situation. He knows he's loved. And the Spirit of God that made all things is with him. So he's good. He says in verse 45, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin and I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the, enemy, of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Who's the emphasis on? Who's doing the good work here? God. 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 And he will use me, and I'll strike you down, but it is God who's doing this, right? David's emphasis is so key. All right. Narrative tension heightens. Verse 48 through 49. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Oh, like this is so cinematic, isn't it? This David runs at the serpent. This is like the best movie action sequence. Tension ratchets to fever pitch. Can you imagine the silence on the, on the ridges as both armies are watching this thing happen? Like the little kids running at the giant. Tension ratchets, pulses rise. David whirls his leather sling and somewhere mid-stride, he, he shifts his weight, flicks his wrist, and he hurls the stone bullet. In a flash, the stone sinks into the skull of Goliath. The text says the stone sank into his forehead. That word means to penetrate or to submerge like something sunk in water. The rock goes through his head. It does not just kind of stick. You know, like when you fall on gravel and you pull a little pebble out? Like it goes into his head. See, David brought a gun to a sword fight. A well-wielded sling is tantamount to a handgun. And, and this is so cool. Again, we can skip over things so quickly. Unhurried presence. Like slow down. Read the text. Roll it over in your head and your heart. Link it all up with the other scriptures. There's another serpent reference right here. Don't miss it. Help me out. Which way does David, or does Goliath fall? Which way does Goliath fall? Forward, right? Face forward. How is this a serpent reference? Well, some of you are already ahead of me and you're itching to say it. Genesis 3, 14 through 15. Go back to the beginning. God is talking to the serpent. The Lord God said to the Nachash, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat. Your mouth will be in the dirt, serpents. All the days of your life, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, her zera or seed, and her, her offspring, your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. <laughs> so on his belly, the scaly bronze serpent goes, 
right? Another serpent literally bites the dust. And it's with a head wound. The seed of the woman, David, strikes the head of the serpent, Goliath. Come on. That's awesome. And then after the stone comes the sword. It just gets better. Like, it just gets better, guys. Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. This is interesting, though. There was no sword in the hand of David. The text wants us to know that. That's why it says it. Right? Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Where's the sword? I, literally, this was hitting me for the first time. He pulls it out of Goliath's... Goliath couldn't even get it out of his sheath before he was taken down. That's awesome. Okay, just notice that for the first time. Where was I? Okay. David ran, stood over the Philistine, took the sword and drew it out of its sheath, killed him, cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they freaked out and ran, right? And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout. You better believe they did, right? And, and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell in the way from Sha'arim as far as Gath and Ekron. Text makes it clear. David had no sword. So just for sake, this is rhetorical. You know it. Whose sword does he use? Goliath's sword. Wait. Okay, so Goliath's down. There's a hush on the ridges where these armies are, Right? Can you imagine, like, the, the awe and, and fear that rose on both sides? It just must have been this hush. And then it was, ah, freak out, run, and then, yeah, let's go and flood into the valley. Like, what, what a moment. But there must have been this pregnant silence after that thud of this huge guy falling down. But he, David uses the enemy's own, David uses the enemy's own sword to defeat him. That is powerful. We'll get right back to that. Now I'm hoping what, what we're beginning to see is the, the Christological imagery, the gospel shape that's, that's taking on clarity as we read the story. Because this story is the Bible in miniature. It's the gospel foreshadowed. The point of the story is, is not simply step up, face your giants. The point of the story is is you face a battle you cannot win. You face an enemy that has you quaking in your boots, and there is no hope you're going to take him down. Your only hope is a spirit-anointed champion of God's choosing who will, in a counterintuitive strike, take down the enemy and use the enemy's own weapon against him. And this one is the middleman, the representative, the atoning one, the mediator whom God has chosen. Your only hope is a middleman that can win a battle against evil, sin, and death that you could never win on your own. You're saved by grace through faith. See, as so often we do with Scripture, we make it man-centered rather than God-centered. Because where are we in this story? And we can learn all sorts of lessons from David, but I would put forward to you, I would submit to you that the emphasis in the story when it comes to where we are is we're not David. <laughs> we're God's people on the ridge who are quaking in our boots and can't win the battle. But I want to push it even further and say we are also the Philistines on the other ridge who have been against God and his ways and trying to take down his kingdom of love and joy and peace and hope. We're this weird mixture of those two. I mean, maybe you're here and you're, you're the one who's been against God and you don't even know why you're here today. Or maybe you're one who follows this Jesus, but there's such fear, shame, guilt, and anxiety that you're paralyzed and you can't even move. The point is, we're not David in this story. The emphasis of the story is to point us to the true David. We are those deadlocked in sin, shame, guilt, and fear. 
and Jesus is the beloved one. Remember, David's name means beloved. Jesus is the unlikely and unexpected one who goes on a mission from his father to come down from the house of bread, Bethlehem, to go to the battle where his brothers are facing imminent death and a battle that they cannot win and he to step in and win the battle for them. Jesus, like David, takes full responsibility and action to guard and to keep God's garden. Jesus does not just listen to the serpent and his twisted narratives about God. He does something about it and overcomes evil with good. It's so good. Jesus runs into the fray, crushes the head of the serpent. And according to Genesis 3.15, Jesus is wounded, right? The son of the woman will be wounded in doing so. In Jesus' death on the cross, he overcomes and crushes the evil one, putting our sin to death. Jesus uses the enemy's weapon against him. David picked up the sword of Goliath that was meant to slay him, and Jesus climbs up on the cross that was meant to be his death, and that becomes the weapon that crushes the enemy. The cross that was meant to destroy becomes the instrument of reconciliation and redemption. What a savior! What a king. And then at once, right, he slayed this dragon, right? David slays this dragon, the serpent. And what, what, what do God's people do who are up on the ridge? You, you, they probably cheer, right? Come on, let's do it. Yeah! Like everyone. Come on. They're like, yes! And they like pour in, like they flood into this valley up the other side and they rout the evil. They push back the shadow. They push back the shadow. What are we called to do as those who watch our king crush the enemy? The church on mission is to bring the kingdom of heaven of light and love and push back the shadow everywhere we go, wherever our feet step. There is the light and the love of the kingdom. And so many of us are okay with coming to church on Sunday. Like barely pushing back our five o'clock shadow to shave just to go to church. We are called to be ambassadors Amen. of light and love to push back the shadow wherever the shadow, wherever the curse is found. Yeah, now I have to come to a close. Uh, I'd love for us to feast on the story all day long, but here's a verse I didn't read at the very end. And oh, look, listen, this is crazy. Verses 53 through 54. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. So good. But then this, come on, this is weird. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. David took the head of the Philistine and he took it to Jerusalem. This is weird. You know why? Jerusalem isn't Jerusalem. It's, it's a city run by some Jebusites. It's not King David's city. It's not the capital. It's run by enemies. This is anachronistic. This shouldn't be here. Why is this here? And you have a bunch of, you know, critical scholars who are like, this is poor editing. See, the Bible's all... It's like, just no. Can I, can I suggest that this sentence is just glowing with this gospel light? Amen. That by the Spirit, David does this odd, in-the-moment thing. Because one day... Outside the city walls of Jerusalem, the greater son of David would climb the hill of Calvary, known as the place of the skull. Calvary, skull, Latin. Golgotha, skull, Aramaic. That the greater son of David would climb up on Calvary. He would be lifted up on a cross. He would be seen as a curse, like that serpent, the bronze serpent up on the post. And anybody who looked to this one, who climbed up on that cross to crush the head of the enemy, would be saved. I cannot prove it to you. And I'm not going to try to prove it. But I believe David posted up that skull of the serpent Goliath on a stick there on Calvary, because someday Christ would crush the head of the true serpent Amen. there. David points us to Jesus. 
That's the point. David points us to Jesus. David was anointed, went back to the wilderness to be with the animals, comes back to his people after a time of testing, and, you know, 40 days, and then he slays the invading serpent. Jesus, baptized, anointed, goes into the wilderness, a time of testing, 40 days. First thing back that he does in the synagogue that we find out in the Gospels is he goes into the synagogue and he exercises. He kicks out a serpent. He kicks out the evil. It's the same pattern. It's what he does in your life. He comes in and he kicks out the evil, kicks out the darkness, so that then you too can go and be an ambassador of light time is up. May the scales fall from your eyes like they did when Paul clearly saw the resurrected Jesus. May we see the Bible as the book that points us to Jesus over and over and over again. And may we repent of the sin of mistrusting God and placing our trust in the ways, the warfare, the weapons, the armor, and the strategies of man. So friends, trust in Jesus and it will be as Paul wrote in Romans 16 verse 20, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the joy of your word. You're amazing. That was a multitude of words today. I pray what what stands out, what, what radiates forth is the beauty of Christ and the magnificence, the salvation that we have in him. So Lord, um, may, may we trust you. Help us to follow you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.